The question we want to talk about in these 45 minutes is we know that the role of the media is critical in changing public perception. What we want to have a greater understanding of is how can we as civil society organizations and as private sector, as governments and donors, engage with the media in having a greater enabling policy making environment. So I'm going to begin by asking Professor Yasmin, has, has the public always been this anxious about migration as, it, as we see today in the media? Um, well, yes, it's always been anxious from about 1534. It's been <laughs> anxious. Um, but I'll come back to that. Let me, I just want to make two, just two or three minutes of your time before I answer this very important question. Um, first of all, apologies, I am not fasting. I can't do such a long day in the summer, mm -hmm. so I hope I'm forgiven, mm -hmm. and I'm sending zakat, but I just can't do it, so <laughs> please forgive my weakness. Um, the second thing is I have to leave prom promptly at the end because my mother-in-law, who's 92, has fallen, and we have to get mm -hmm. to Brighton. But I was going to tell you a story about her anyway, because not that long ago, she's very English, she um, lives on the south coast, with, until very recently, really a very white area near Brighton. Uh, not that Brighton is very mixed, but outside Brighton, it, they're very small places, often older people, and so on. And one day she said to me, when I went to see her, she said, what's all this? What's going on? What is this silent creeper that's everywhere? I'm hearing it spreading everywhere. What is this silent creeper? Why won't you tell me? What silent creeper, Vera? What silent creeper? She, it's growing everywhere. So she went on like this and eventually turned out that she had heard asylum seeker. <laughs> And she's half deaf. So she had heard all the vocabulary of it spreading and it's everywhere. And, and she thought it was some kind of a plant that is taking over the gardens of England, which just shows how you raise panic, actually. Um, it made me, uh, actually it made me realize, you know, the emotional effect of how my industry um, is conducting itself. So in answer to your question, I say yes. Um, people, uh, there's an awful lie that is told in this country, and I'm often writing about this, that it's only now, it's only now we are so intolerant because there's too many of you or them, and, um, and you know, they're taking everything and um, so on. Well, I came from Uganda in 1972, and if you look at the newspapers, from that time, exactly the same, exactly the same headlines, exactly the same stories and panic. But we were lucky because public opinion then was with us. I think what's different now is public opinion is really not with migrants and refugees. But go back, go back um, to um, the 16th century. Shakespeare wrote a play, in an unfinished play, in which he gave a speech to Thomas um, More, which was about, you are treating Huguenots, these outside foreign workers, in this way. You attack them, you do this. Well, okay, let's throw them out, let's, let's see them off. Once you have started this, what you have unleashed will come back to you. And there's a wonderful line. It will shock upon you. This, these attitudes will come back at you. So it, you look at history. In fact, there was an, in 16th century, there's an MP from um, Bristol who wrote a nasty little pamphlet against French workers who were here because the king wanted to give, King Charles II wanted to give them full rights. And he wrote a pamphlet saying, kick out the bill and kick out the foreigners. And here is what happened. It's really interesting. Parliament 
ordered that pamphlet to be burned and that speech to be taken out of Hansard, out of the records. And they said, a parliamentarian does not speak like this and turn people against workers. So actually, one might argue that there was a time when parliamentarians <coughs> behave slightly better than they do now. <laughs> so... Arguably <laughs> not difficult. <laughs> no, arguably not difficult. So the answer is yes, but it is much worse now, partly because parliamentarians have all ganged together and will not defend migrant workers whilst exploiting them. He wanted me here to straight talk. I'm straight talking. Yeah. That is straight <laughs> talking. So, so that's, uh, in a nutshell, uh, things have gone worse hmm. last few decades. They've, got, they've gone worse, not that the, every group that came here, you talk to Jewish people, hmm. what their grandfathers and grandmothers said. What is different now is that the media is, except for the Independent and, and Guardian and sometimes the Mirror, is absolutely against uh, mm -hmm. migrant workers and so on. The BBC, which used to be fair, is no longer fair. Um, and uh, like I said, there is no one in any of the parties who has the guts to stand up and say, actually, not only is this wrong, but our economy has, from the 16th century, depended on migrant workers. Nobody has the guts because of the UKIP factor. The UKIP factor has been a terrifying factor. Thanks, Yasmin. So there, there is one organization and then a few others. Um, we're joined by Awali from the Migrants' Rights Network who do have the guts to stand up and say something. But I'm wondering, Awale, in this tricky ground that Yasmin just talked to us about, how do you and your organization navigate this, what seems to be a very polarized, difficult political landscape? How, how does your organization act, champion migrants' rights? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, I guess it was Mark Twain who said, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. And I think, I think that's what uh, Yasmin so passionately just outlined a, a moment ago, which I totally agree with, actually. Um, the, the media in our case, the, we, as, as I said before, the media is inadequate, superficial, and uh, subject to bias. And we've seen that quite a lot over the past 10 years. It's getting even worse now. And it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting because the debate generally is about numbers. So there's too many people coming in, um, too many people, our, resources are, our resources are at a stretch, uh, we don't like it, um, our communities are changing, nobody asked us. Um, so, so, so the debate, the, the, the narrative keeps coming back and back and back. And the underlying rationale there is there's a longing for, for a yesterday gone. Uh, so kind of uh, gauging that message and understanding that message is really quite crucial if you're trying to navigate the tricky waters. Because what we try and deal with is, 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 a, is a mass of, of, of anti-migrant hysteria. But at the same time, you do have some friends on your side, like the people, people like Yasmin and, and the Independent and Guardian, etc. and so forth. So we, what we do is we focus our arguments um, on a rights-based um, Right, right space, and and, and uh, the need to focus the messaging on the uh, on the need for evidence-based uh, policy making. So we don't fight fire with fire, but we fight fire with evidence. I, I, I would say, and that prism is really important because if you're trying to navigate through tricky waters when when the Daily Mail is against you, the second most popular um, newspaper in the country and the BBC is going the other way, kind of going to Migration Watch as a source of serious evidence, um, then you've, you've really got, you've, you know, every step forward you take, you take 10 steps back. So you have to be quite conscious of that fact. Um, public opinion, 70%, apparently 70% of the, uh, uh, the UK public are against more immigration. They want to see less immigration. Uh, they don't quite understand how many people who come in, um, why the reasons why people come in. Um, and they don't quite know the actual numbers who come in. 
uh, they don't know the majority of migrants who come in who tend to be students. People they like students. Public opinion, but pu the public likes students. Uh, the second most people that come into our country are our um, uh, spouses and children of British residents. Uh, the 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 argument there becomes a bit more nuanced. Um, it becomes a bit more difficult to understand because people generally say that people should have a right to a family life, but. Um, people say that, it, that that family member shouldn't use um, the public resources, shouldn't use INHS, shouldn't um, be entitled to housing, such and so forth. Um, and um, uh, fourthly, uh, po policymakers are now moving away from um, a rights rights based approach to policy making. So that's that's quite important uh, to understand at the same time when you're trying to navigate tricky waters. Because if policymakers aren't on your side, believe me, you're just going to have a really tough time trying to um, uh, try to change public opinion. So I would say I, I would outline those those four particular points um, in, in answer to that, to that particular question and the challenges civil society in general faces when trying to gauge and, and, and actually um, uh, change public opinion, inspire a different kind of a message. So uh, yeah, that, that's my response there. Thanks. Yasmin, I, I want to ask you what drives the media agenda on migration because you were talking about it getting worse in the last few decades. S are there any structural barriers within the media? Is it acting as a mirror of society or is it driving the agenda? It's very hard to know, but I think from where I sit, it is manufacturing. The media can manufacture panic. It can manufacture false happiness over, if you have a you know, 1,000 pound suit, you will feel you're in heaven. It can manufacture desires. It can manufacture feelings of defensiveness. And it does every day of our lives. Um, where I think the difference is, um, and it's a very important difference, and I think Awale is right, that the BBC is our BBC, whoever we are, because we pay for it. And I am very disappointed sometimes that migrant workers themselves and migrant groups and powerful migrants don't daily, hourly, write to the BBC. Because if you do that, the BBC is by law compelled to listen and to answer. And say every day, after a particularly disgusting program, they had one recently, I think this Monday or Sunday, 400 people wrote in, right? Bit by bit, you would chip away at what is becoming a free-for-all. So sometimes I think people feel they're powerless, and they are when it comes to most newspapers who have a position and they're never going to change from it. But the other thing is, and this is where it gets a little bit more interesting, the Daily Mail often asks me to write for them. And, and it isn't what they want me to write, it's what they know I write. So two weeks ago, three weeks ago, they rang me and said, do you want to do a, a piece on how, as a migrant, you migrants can help the children of working class kids become more ambitious and more hardworking? Daily Mail. I did it. They ran it. Word for word, they didn't change anything. They even checked the headline with me at 9 o'clock. And what I think is happening there, and it's just, is that and I've done a lot of other stuff for them along these lines. I'm never going to do, they know, and they respect it, that I'm never going to do anything which is against what I believe. But at the same time, it does commission, not just me, sometimes other people, to kind of write against its own position. Now, I think it's because they've realized, like m uh, some newspapers have realized, that there are more and more migrant, people of migrant background who are middle class, who are like the advertising uh, world has realized this. So I, I don't, I, you know, sometimes it's, but the paper which never does this, in my view, is the Telegraph. The Telegraph agenda 
is absolute in my view and you never get an alternative mischievous challenge to its own values um, nor does the sun the sun does what the sun does um, except I think it behaved very well after the 7-7 bombings so there is a point in actually always writing to newspapers and also reminding them like I'm always reminding them so you want Europeans not to be able to come here and use the public services so should Spain throw out all the Brits who have ruined the you know the cost of Rama <laughs> should they throw them out because I don't hear Spain doing this at all I, they have had a much worse austerity period um, so I think sometimes I think there is a resignation when this comes at you all the time, all the time, and we all think, what's the point, you know? And, and I think that, because I get it. But I think, especially with the BBC and Channel 4, responding individually, but in great numbers, if you see what I mean, um, pays off. So it's a very bad space out there. And, you know, I think, uh, yes, the, uh, you know, I, I, what Awali says is right too, just providing evidence-based sober counter-narratives is good. But stories too, because as he said, it's always numbers, never names, never stories, right? But even numbers, 53, we've only taken 53 Syrian refugees. 53 so far. I mean, think about that. We go around talking about the human rights disaster, and we've only taken 53 women and children. So, write letters saying, write letters to every paper, saying, why have only 53 uh, people been admitted? Or migrant workers' remittances. The figures were astonishing, actually. I have to say those figures I'm, I will use. Um, but I, I don't feel very optimistic. I mean, I fight my battle, and a few of us fight the battle. But uh, we need migrants and those of migrant heritage to stop doing what too many of them are, actually, siding with the anti-migrant lobby, which I think they should die of shame about, actually. Um, you know, we've got people in cabinet today whose parents are migrants. We've got people in all the parties whose grandparents, they need to be on the side of migrants, and often they're not. Thank you, Yasmin. So you're, you're urging us to not be resigned. No. And you're asking us to provide more evidence and keep up the fight. And that's what Awale said as well. And I want to take this opportunity to ask Awale, with the evidence that you've been providing, have you seen any major successes through that engagement with the media? Absolutely. Um, if I can, in, in the last 18 months, what we did was we did a, an excellent inquiry called the Family Migration Inquiry. Uh, that inquiry in particular focused on the government's rules um, on, on British residents who want to uh, bring a spouse over and bring a spouse and children over. Uh, what the government now has done is it's it's brought in new rules that say you have to earn at least eighteen thousand six hundred pounds to be able to bring a spouse in, twenty two thousand pounds to be able to bring a spouse and a child in, and twenty four thousand pounds for an extra child, such and so forth. So there's basically a price on your love um, in the UK now. So you can't get married, or you can't bring a spouse over to the UK. So you can't fall in love with a foreigner, for example, if you if you earn anything if you earn eighteen thousand five hundred ninety nine pounds, you're not allowed to fall in love. Um, so, so we so we focus on that particular issue because there's huge human rights violations there. Um, so we campaigned on that. We set up an inquiry looking into the rules. We had a cross-party group of parliamentarians looking at it. We launched the report um, last June. It had over 300 families and organisations and others who who wrote in saying, you know, this is outrageous. You know, how how could how could this happen to me? I'm a British citizen. Why is why are immigration policies affecting me? I'm white British. How 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 is it I'm being affected by immigration policies? Um, so th there was quite a continuous or continuum of, of 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 that kind of level of evidence that was coming in. So we we launched the report. It had huge media coverage. It went all the way up to Newsnight. It went 
you know, it, it was it was the number one thing on radio. I mean, it was it, people were just surprised at the level of uh, anger and dissatisfaction that, that there was against the government on this particular issue. And 40% of the British public are actually disenfranchised by this policy. 40% um, of, of the British public do not earn £18,600. So you're looking at a huge weight swathe of people who, if they wanted to get married to some someone who's a non-EEA uh, 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 national, they can't do that. And on top of that, European citizens have a lot more rights than British citizens when it comes to this issue. And that was that that brought a lot more anger. I mean, I mean, come on. Imagine UKIP saying, you know, that, that, that's UKIP territory we've just walked into right there and then. Um, you know, how how can any as they always say, how can any Polish re vagrant come to this country, or else we can't get any uh, decent um, Ghanaian oncologists, etc., and so forth, coming here? And that's and that's the argument they make. Um, and these people who have been disenfranchised are the people who are more likely to vote UKIP. Um, so the media response was fantastic. Even the Daily Mail supported this this particular campaign we kicked off. Um, um, and what that triggered was three parliamentary debates. Um, in the House, of, one in House of Commons, one, one in House of Lords, and another one in House of Commons, all had cross-party support. All had different um, MPs of a different uh, political colour uh, leading it, and and uh, we've been quite successful um, bring cha changing public opinion, pu changing public attitudes uh, on on this particular issue. However, the government's still um, hell bent on reducing um, the net migration target which again takes us back to the whole issue about numbers. We've got this arbitrary target that the government is trying to achieve. Uh, and, and that's causing a lot of anguish and, 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 and it's causing um, um, families a lot of anguish, it's causing a lot, uh, universities a lot of anguish, it's causing um, businesses a lot of anguish. So, so, you know, at the cost of our economy, at the cost of you know, the fabric of society that the Conservative Party champions, um, where the, our immigration policies are actually having a, um, 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 uh, an adverse um, impact. So that's where we have been successful in terms of uh, engaging with the media. So that's one particular example I thought I should give. Well done. Yeah, indeed. Can we have a round of applause well, for that success? <laughs>